Hello. In this online module, we'll be focused on the concept of computer hardware. Our definition of a computer really is four basic components, and those include hardware, software, media, and data. As you recall from our earlier discussion in legal issues, this lecture is really going to focus on the hardware issue. That's the tangible part of the computer that we can touch and feel. Now, one of the components of that is also media. So we will discuss media devices as part of this discussion as well. Now, it, I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about what our specific objective is here. And it's not to turn you into computer engineers. You really don't have to understand how these things are constructed from the standpoint of being able to create one, but it really is helpful to understand what the major components are that are associated with your basic computer and how we evaluate things such as capacity and speed. The objective here really is to provide you with enough of a background to know what questions to ask if you're making a decision to purchase or to upgrade a computer either personally or in a work environment. And for that to happen, again, it's helpful to understand what are the major components and how do they work together? What, what, are, what tasks are they responsible for and how do we measure their performance? Now, as we go through this, we'll notice that there are a lot of terms that are associated with the use of computer technology, gigabytes and megabits and gigahertz and all kinds of stuff like that. It's really not that difficult to understand what they mean if you kind of understand the code behind them. There's really a structure to how these terms are used and how they're applied. So if, if they all seem fairly confusing at this point, that's quite all right, uh, because one of the objectives here is to provide you with kind of an understanding of how those terms work. And the cool, cool thing about that is that once you understand how those terms work, you can hear one of those terms that you possibly have never heard before, and you should be able to figure out what it means, what it applies to, and how to interpret it. So we'll talk quite a bit about terminology with respect to this discussion. Now, beginning with your basics of a computer, um, you've all seen what a computer looks like. This is kind of a fancy one that's used for gaming with a clear glass panel on one side and all kinds of cool LED lighting inside. But um, the question here is what's on the inside of these things? What are the major components that make them tick? Now, you may or may not have ever looked inside of a computer or actually made some changes to your computer or modifications or possibly have built one. Regardless of where you're coming from, we're going to start at square one for this discussion and then move somewhat rapidly through the, uh, the basics so that everyone is on the same page as we go forward. Now, all computers pretty much look the same inside, although they can look radically different outside. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a Mac or a PC or a laptop or a tablet or a, um, a desktop computer, a tower. Inside, the components are essentially all the same. It doesn't mean they're, they're identical and clones of one another, but uh, they, they do have the same types of components that perform the same sort of tasks. Just like every car is going to have an engine and a transmission, although not the same engine and transmission. It's going to be adapted to the particular vehicle. Just like the components in computers are adapted to the particular computers. If we take a look inside of a computer, picture that one we were just looking at, but laid on its side with its cover off. This is roughly what you would see inside. And again, it, the components here will be the same inside of every computer, although they may not look exactly the same. But we're going to start with one key component referred to as the motherboard, sometimes referred to as the main board. And in our computer, this right here is the motherboard. It's essentially a very large circuit board. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a PC board or a printed circuit board. And it contains all of the major components that communicate with the brain of the computer, which is the central processing unit. So it's a fairly large rectangular circuit board. And in this case, you can see it, it takes up maybe the majority 
of the space inside of the computer. It's fairly flat, but it's got lots of stuff on it. And one of the important facts about the motherboard is that the motherboard is essentially where the central processing unit lives, which we'll come back to shortly. Because the motherboard is a way for various components to communicate with the brain of the computer or the central processing unit, a lot of the motherboard is dedicated to providing connections to those different types of computer uh, components. One of the ways that is done is through something called expansion slots. And on this motherboard, you can see the expansion slots. And these are these, these whitish looking slots here. There are six of them. And uh, each one of them can accommodate some sort of expansion card. Now, expansion cards are basically circuit boards that are used to provide an interface to some other device. So an expansion card, for example, might be a place where you can plug in a network cable or a monitor or speakers or a microphone, some other device that needs to communicate with the CPU. Now, there are all kinds of different devices that can use expansion cards. I have an expansion card on mine that allows me to plug different types of video devices, uh, for example, camcorders and, and so forth, into my computer so that I can do digital video editing with them. So there are lots of different things. They can accommodate external hard drives, uh, tape drives for used for backups, um, certain types of specialized media. There are expansion cards that can provide uh, graphic processing uh, for, for monitors uh, or something called a GPU, which is a graphics processing unit. It's like a little brain just for processing graphics. So that's the role of an expansion card. Inside of a computer, this is what an expansion card looks like if it's being plugged into one of the slots. So picture that card we were just looking at being plugged into one of these expansion slots. And you can see that the back of the card pokes out the back of the computer. And that's the place normally where you're going to be plugging devices into the card. Again, like a monitor or a tape drive or some other type of, of device. So expansion cards plug into expansion slots and are used to allow the computer to interface with other types of devices that weren't built into it originally. If we return back to the computer, we can find our next device that we'll, we'll discuss, our next component, which is called the central processing unit or the CPU. So when we refer to CPU, that's essentially the brain of the computer. The formal name is the central processing unit. And it's the thing really that is responsible for everything the computer does. So in other words, all the decisions that are made by the computer, I call them decisions, and basically that's what they are. They're all done by the CPU. It's the thing that decides things. So there are three major tasks that I'll define. And this is really not a very comprehensive list at all. But it's a very quick way to, I think, summarize the major things that the CPUs are responsible for. The first is that the CPU manages the flow of data. And what that means is that at any given time, there's all kinds of data being input into the computer and output by the computer. Computers are input output devices. They're constantly taking in data and then sending it back to you. Think about um, sitting at a keyboard and typing maybe a paper into Microsoft Word or some other word processor. As you're typing, the characters are being input through an external device, a peripheral device, which is the keyboard. And that data is going to the CPU. The CPU is deciding what to do with that data. And it does a number of things with it. So as you type a character, let's say you type the character A on your keyboard, the CPU receives that and then decides what happens next. Well, it possibly adds it to the document that you're, you are creating and puts it into a certain place in its memory to keep track of it there. And at the same time, it's showing you the, the character by displaying it on the screen. Okay, that's an input output 
operation. You've input it to the CPU. The CPU has decided what to do with it and then outputs it back to you. It's showing it back to you on the monitor, which is yet another peripheral device. So this process of input and output is occurring. At any given time, there's a ton of this stuff happening inside the computer. There's this constant flow of data in various directions. The CPU is the device that keeps track of all of that. You don't have to keep track of it. You don't really need to know exactly where that data is coming and going to every moment that you're working on the computer, but the CPU does. So it keeps track of that data and it directs the flow. You can sort of think of it kind of like the uh, traffic cop in an intersection that's deciding where cars should go. Or actually a better, a better analogy might be a dispatcher who decides where uh, delivery people need to be going to and from in order to get optimal deliveries. And in this case, optimal deliveries of data. The second task that the CPU is responsible for is to interpret and execute instructions. So for a computer, those instructions come in the form of computer software. That's where the data is coming from, or for the instructions are coming from. And it's essentially like sort of like the to-do list for the computer. It figures out exactly what those instructions mean, uh, it interprets them, and then it executes them. It makes it happen. So uh, there's a document that needs to be printed. It sends it to the printer. So it, it executes the instruction. It makes the thing occur, whatever that is that needs to occur at any given point in time. Many of those instructions are things that might be obvious to you as you're watching. For example, you, you hit the print button and something comes out of the printer. It's fairly obvious that there was a cause and effect there. Uh, many of them are not. There, there are literally millions of operations and tasks that are occurring in the background constantly when you use a computer. And you have no clue that it's even happening, nor do you need to really, because again, it's the CPU's job to keep track of those things. Finally, we have math. CPUs can do math. Um, the uh, fancy term that's often used is that they're able to do floating point calculations, meaning that they're not simply dealing with integers or just um, ones and zeros, uh, but they're able to deal with fractional numbers, numbers with decimal points. So they're able to deal with real numbers. And this is one of those terms that maybe is a little bit old fashioned and archaic in some ways because all computers can do floating point calculations now. But at one point in time, that wasn't really the case. So uh, these are the three basic tasks of the, com of the CPU inside the computer. Manages the flow of data interprets and executes instructions from the software, and it can do math. Now, if we take a look at a CPU, um, it's basically a silicone chip. There really isn't a whole lot to it. It's not very big. It's maybe about, most CPUs are probably about uh, one inch by one inch, and it's just kind of a silicone wafer. It's got a whole bunch of pins uh, I believe this one is probably 268 that poke out of the bottom of the chip, which is what you are looking at here. And those pins drop into um, a, a slot that basically has exactly the same number of holes and exactly the same configuration. There's only one way it can go in. And if you look, you'll see that one side of the chip there has a, kind of an angle cut out of it, and that's out of one of the corners and that's how you line it up. That's how you know where what orientation it goes into. And if the pins are not bent, it'll drop right into its little holes and uh, latch closed and you have an installed CPU. Here's what a CPU looks like when it's plugged into the computer without the fan on top. You'll notice that there's a little lever kind of to the bottom of the socket there. And that lever is to lock the CPU into place. It's called a zero insertion force or a ZIF socket. And uh, CPU will drop right in. Those pins will line up perfectly with the holes. And then the little lever just cinches down on the whole thing and makes it stay in place so it can't move and can not fall out. Really quite easy to install. CPUs have ability to 
really process a huge amount of data and do all kinds of really cool stuff. They also have the ability to generate an incredible amount of heat. When CPUs are working, the faster they work, the more heat they generate. And that's the reason that you'll typically see CPU fans installed on top of the CPUs. Now on our earlier image inside of the computer, you can see that there what what is in that circle is not really the CPU, it's the fan that is sitting on top of the CPU. And this is what a fan looks like standalone. And there's different varieties. They're, they come bigger and smaller depending on the, the type of CPU and how much heat it's going to generate. But they can really generate an incredible amount of heat. If you've ever worked with a laptop on your lap for any length of time and had it doing something particularly challenging, one of the things that you might notice is that they can get pretty warm and you can really feel that heat coming through. And that's typically heat that is being generated by the CPU and, uh, and other similar components. So um, CPUs need to be kept cool, and that's the reason these fans are used. The fan works kind of like the radiator on your car. So there's a fan, and it's mounted to a large aluminum block. And in that aluminum block, you'll see there's, there's kind of ribs going through there fins. If you looked at it from the side, you'd see you can actually look right through and see daylight the other side. Uh, and they work very similar to how a radiator works uh, or how an air-cooled engine works. The, uh, they basically are radiating heat from the CPU and then the fan is circulating air through those, those heat sinks and allowing it to dissipate. And then it gets blown out from another fan out the back of the case. So, um, Again, if you work with a computer for any length of time and you've ever put your hand kind of back by one of the vents where you feel air blowing through, uh, and it's usually typically very warm or kind of hot, that's the air coming through from the CPU. Now, here's my little tip of the day. Laptops are particularly susceptible to overheating. One of the reasons is because there are, it's really kind of confined area inside of a laptop and tablets because of the way they're constructed. There isn't really a lot of room for airflow to occur. Consequently, it's real easy for a lot of dust to build up. This is actually a picture of a laptop fan that's been in use for a while. The dust just collects in there and it doesn't always come out. So typically when a lot of overheating starts to occur, it's because a lot of dust has built up around the fan blades and around the insides of the vents. And it's it's impeding the airflow. Normally, you'll see that this problem occurs when you, you can spot a couple of key symptoms. Uh, one is that uh, you'll see freeze ups. So if you have a computer that tends to just sort of freeze up unexpectedly, and uh, you can associate it with times where the computer's been on for a while and you, you physically feel it getting hot, there's a very good chance that it's overheating. And typically when that occurs, the CPU and other components get to the point where they can just no longer operate at that heat level. Uh, you'll again also see like the exterior of the computer getting really hot to the touch. It should get warm, that's expected, but it shouldn't get really hot to the touch to where it's almost like burning hot. And uh, then finally, the blue screen of death. <laughs> and this one is something that many Windows users are familiar with. And this is where you get the big, scary blue screen with some incredibly frightening error message that typically has the word fatal in it. And uh, that's usually referred to as the BSOD or the blue screen of death. When these things start happening and they're associated with the computer being on for a while and feeling hot, very good chance that it's caused by overheating. The solution is actually pretty simple in most cases. And it, it really is just a matter of using compressed air, something like dust off or any product like that, they basically are all essentially just liquid nitrogen that's uh, compressed so it, it can produce a steady flow of, uh, of air. And um, going through around the computer, under it, behind it, finding all the little air vents where air either comes into or exits the computer and uh, just really kind of sticking a little nozzle in there and blasting it out. 
And uh, I suggest that if you do that, don't get too close to it the first time. Uh, I think I did that the first time I ever tried it because I wanted to see what came out. And what came out was a small mushroom cloud of dust. It actually created quite a bit of a dust cloud in the room. So uh, stand back, don't inhale at the time and uh, blast away. And you'll sometimes be surprised at just how much will come out of there. A friend's daughter recently was having a problem with uh, her laptop freezing up. She was away at college at the time, asked me if I had any suggestions. And um, based on what she said, what she described, it sounded like it was an overheating problem. I went ahead and suggested she give this a try. And sure enough, it worked. The freeze up stopped and the computer went back to normal. So it, uh, it can work actually a surprising amount of the time. If it doesn't work, then there's something else going on, either there's still dust inside or a fan might not be working and that does sometimes happen uh, or there's just some other unrelated issue uh, occurring but it's a fairly quick inexpensive thing to try and really doesn't take a lot of skill to make it work and I should also mention that some computers and uh, some tablets uh, Macs in particular uh, don't always use fans. Now, this is typically true of the smaller, lighter ones uh, like Mac Airs, where they, uh, they they use radiant cooling instead of uh, airflow. So uh, in those situations, uh, all bets are off. There's either something else going on or the, um, the, the cooling technology is not working for some other reason. Finally, one last tip. Always try to use laptops on a hard surface. So rather than your lap or a mattress or a couch or all the other places that we love to use our laptops, um, hard surface is really best, a desk, a tabletop, so that there's enough airflow underneath the uh, computer that it's able to, uh, to disperse the heat. And uh, if you do those things, it'll actually help quite a bit with the performance of the computer. Next, we're going to go on to random access memory or RAM. So if you've ever heard the term RAM associated with a computer, most people know intuitively that it has something to do with memory of some sort, uh, but not necessarily what it stands for. It does stand for random access memory, uh, which is a term that made a lot of sense 30 or 40 years ago. Not quite so much today because all memory is random access regardless of whether or not it's this type of memory or not. The way to think about RAM in a computer is that it is short-term memory. It's a temporary location where the CPU stores information while it's working on it. I like to use the analogy that it's sort of like your desk. When you're working on, say, paying bills or doing your taxes or some other task like that, you dig your documents out of a file cabinet, put them on your desk, and you work on them. When you're done, you put them away back in a file cabinet. That's sort of like how a computer uses RAM. It's sort of like its desk, as opposed to getting something out of the file cabinet every time it needs to look at it. Much more efficient just to have it right out in front of you. So RAM in a computer is really just silicone chips that look something like this. They're on a little strip of circuit board. There's a little edge connector that plugs into a slot in the motherboard. Each one of those little chips is part of the, the we, we call this whole thing a RAM chip, but it's really made up of a collection of chips. In this case, there are eight of them. RAM chips don't hold a lot of data. They don't have a huge capacity, but they don't really need to. Just like you don't have to have a huge desk that can store every piece of information that you own. You just have to have a big enough desk to put the stuff out that you need to work on at any given time. So for a computer, the more RAM it has, the more efficient it can be because there's more stuff it can work on at the same time, just like you having a huge desk. RAM in a computer is one of those things that um, has some really interesting characteristics. It's solid state memory, meaning that it's microchips. There are no moving parts in RAM, as opposed to other types of storage devices. I referred to RAM as being short-term memory. An alternative to that would be long-term memory, like a computer hard drive or a flash drive. Those are devices that are designed to store stuff for 
for a long period of time, as opposed to RAM, which is designed to just store things temporarily. So RAM is very fast. That's a really important characteristic of RAM. It's fast because there are no moving parts. You can put stuff into RAM and get it out of RAM very, very quickly, as opposed to something like a computer hard drive, where there are typically moving parts associated. It has relatively small capacity. It doesn't hold a whole lot, but again, it doesn't really need to. And finally, another characteristic of RAM that's very important is that RAM is considered volatile memory. And what that means is that it only will hold data for as long as it has an electrical an electrical current. That means it's temporary. As soon as the computer is unplugged or rebooted, restarted, whatever, whatever was in RAM goes away. Now, as the user, you don't really have any control over what the CPU puts into RAM. That's totally out of your hands. That's just up to the CPU as to what it feels like it wants to put into RAM uh, at any given point in time, as, as if the CPU has feelings. But you kind of get what I mean, though. The CPU decides what to put in RAM and when. You don't necessarily know what's there, nor do you really need to. It just works in the background. The more RAM that's available, the more efficient the CPU can be. And in fact, the faster the CPU can be, meaning that it won't be constrained as opposed to a CPU with relatively less RAM. Think about yourself in a situation where maybe you're trying to do something fairly complicated, like write a paper. And uh, in order to do that, uh, you need a lot of desk space to hold journal articles and books and other pieces of source material that you are constantly referring to. Um, and in one scenario, you have a nice big desk where you got lots of room to put all that stuff and spread it all out. So it's real easy to be real, to be organized and to get to whatever you need when you need to. In another scenario, you're working on a really tiny little, like a, like a little tray and you have almost no space at all. It's hard to be organized and efficient. You'll work a lot faster with the bigger desk where everything is organized. And that's a really good analogy that you can use with respect to how a CPU uses RAM. The more RAM it has, the more efficient it's going to be. So we can also characterize RAM as being the computer's short-term working method memory. It only needs it for as long as it's working on a particular task. When that task is over, it's going to replace the stuff in RAM with something else, just like you take everything off your desk and replace it with something else when you're ready to go on to a new task. Today, I decided to do my taxes. And as you can see, my desk is not very big. In fact, it's kind of small, and I have fit just about as much paper on it as I possibly can. This is all the information I can squeeze onto it. Now, when I need another piece of information to work on, I have to go to my file cabinet. Instead of just grabbing it off my desk, I need to go look for it, find the piece of information I need, put it on my desk, take something else that will no longer fit, and then put that away. And then I can go back to work on it. But what if I need that other piece of information back? Well, then I, I kind of have to do the reverse. I have to go find it, put it back, and then I have to put something else back so I can, again, get back to work. The problem is that my desk just isn't big enough to hold everything that I really need to have in front of me in order to get the job done. It'd be a lot easier if I could just take everything out of the file cabinet related to my taxes, put them out on one big desk or a kitchen table, and then use that in order to organize my, my process. Then I could just go right to the piece of information I need when I need it. Well, this is kind of the problem faced by a computer CPU. This, for the CPU, RAM is like its desk, and the filing cabinet is like the hard drive. So when a computer needs a piece of information, it goes to the hard drive to get it. Hard drives are kind of slow, they're mechanical devices, and it takes a little while to find that information and deliver it to the CPU, just like it takes me a little while to find information in the file cabinet. Once it puts it on its desk, which is RAM, it can get to it pretty quickly and easily. 
But if that RAM capacity is fairly small and limited, just like my desk is, it takes a lot more effort because then it has to use its hard drive more than it can use RAM. It's just a slower process. So the bottom line is that more RAM makes the computer more efficient. And the reason is because it can get the information it needs in advance, put it all out there, and then just get to it very, very quickly in RAM. Just like me using a much bigger desk. Inside the computer on the motherboard, the RAM is normally found on some little slots that are located on the motherboard. In this case, you can see them just to the right of the CPU. Uh, the RAM chip basically just plugs right in there. There's an edge connector at the bottom that just uh, just gets shoved directly into the uh, sockets. This is kind of what it looks like when you have RAM that has been installed into a socket. And uh, if you want to see the process by which it can be installed, here's a computer uh, with a RAM chip that um, will plug right into the slots. The slots are located just below the CPU. Once we move the wires out of the way, which is usually the biggest part of installing RAM on a computer, it just plugs right in. You'll see there are two little levers on either side of the RAM chip, and those lock in place to remove the RAM. We just shove them on over, and it unlocks the chip, and out it comes. It's that easy to install RAM on a computer. Computers uh, usually have upgradable RAM, meaning you can take the chips out and replace them with larger capacity chips. Sometimes they'll have sockets that have not been fully occupied. You may have a computer with empty sockets. If that's the case, one of the cheapest, fastest ways to upgrade the performance of a computer is to just add RAM to it. Uh, it'll make a fairly dramatic difference if the computer needs more RAM. A computer is likely to need more RAM when you can identify the following things happening. First of all, it gets really slow in multitasking. That means you've got more than one application running at the same time. And uh, very often you'll see it where you, you type a character and it takes like a couple of seconds for that character to appear on the screen. And as it slows down, you'll see that, that little hard drive LED, that little LED that comes on when the hard drive is working, it'll come on and stay on almost constantly. And at the same time, maybe you'll hear the hard drive working uh, at the same time the computer is slowing down where it's just constantly doing something. And uh, th those are basically signs that the computer does not have enough RAM anymore. So now what's happening is it's having to use the hard drive in order to get all, every little bit of information it needs. And an analogy to that might be that you're sitting at your desk, you ran out of desk space, now every single piece of information you need, you have to go dig through your file cabinet for and when, you, when you're done with it, you have to go put it back in the file cabinet. So it, it becomes very very inefficient for it to work and uh, if these if this happens and the computer has the, the capacity for additional ram meaning you can either put in larger chips or you have empty sockets that can be added to then uh, that's actually a really quick fast cheap way to dramatically increase the performance of the computer now that we've spent a little bit of time discussing how computers use devices like RAM, it's a really good time to discuss how we can actually measure information from within the context of a computer system. So when we're talking about measuring information, I'm referring both to measuring data and to measuring software. As you recall, data and software don't really have a physical presence. They're not tangible things. You can't really touch them and feel them although you can touch and feel the media devices that are used to store them. If we start at the most basic level, the smallest piece of information that a computer can deal with is called a bit. And bits are really, really easy to understand because all they are are ones and zeros. If you put enough ones and zeros together in certain combinations, you can do, do all kinds of things on a computer. It's really not important that you understand how those bits or those ones and zeros can turn into other things like computer programs and graphic images and all the things that they're able to do. It's really just important that you know that a bit is a one or a zero. Now, the, as we talk about the remainder of the, the data measurements here, it's important to keep in mind that, first of all, 
this seems kind of confusing because there's a lot of terms that most people don't really understand very well. And they're technical and they're kind of big and they're a little unusual. But the fact of the matter is that they're really not difficult at all. And there's kind of a formula to it. So as we go through this, it's really, really, really a good time to focus just very carefully on, on them and the explanation that I provide as we go along. Now, again, bits are just ones and zeros. By itself, a one or a zero is not a particularly useful thing. However, if we put ones and zeros together in combinations, we can create other things. And uh, the next logical data measurement term that's really a good one to discuss is that of a byte, B-Y-T-E. Now, I'm going to give you two definitions of a byte. The first definition is really not the most important for you to remember. It's actually not terribly important at all uh, for our purposes. It, it would be, if you were a computer scientist, not so much as an end user. So here's my first definition. A byte is equal to eight bits. So if we take eight ones and zeros, eight bits, and put them together in a particular sequence, we can produce a byte. Now, the second definition of a byte is the important one. And this is the one that I really do want you to remember because it, it, it is real important to what we're going to be discussing. A byte is equal to a character. Think about all the different types of characters that you can make on a computer. And you know, a good way to start is just to look at the keyboard and all the things that are on the keyboard, plus literally hundreds of other characters that are not on the keyboard, but can be produced by a computer. Well, a byte is a character. So if you stored five keystrokes of the letter Z, that would require five bytes of storage capacity. So a byte is a character and it's also a unit of measurement. So in this example here we have on the screen, I literally just randomly circled a byte, 11100010. So we have eight ones and zeros grouped together. And then just for fun, I looked it up to see what that equates to. And what it equates to is a um, character which looks like a little light bulb. That's actually a character that a computer is capable of making, and it can be produced with that sequence of ones and zeros. Do you need to know that? No, absolutely not. If you try to remember any of this or you're writing down 11100010 for uh, possible um, use in studying for an exam someday, you're doing it wrong. I really don't care if you know that or not. What's important is that a byte is equal to 8 bits and a byte is equal to a character. And that's the big one. The byte is equal to a character. Now that we've established that bytes are the things that we're really interested in, let's talk a little bit about how we can measure bytes. Now, the best analogy I can think of is that of putting gas in your car and how we measure gas. Now, thinking about maybe the smallest unit of measurement that we deal with when we measure fluids, it's probably ounces. So if we're using ounces as our unit of measurement, consider that one gallon is equivalent of 128 ounces. So if my car has a 16 gallon gas tank, that means that it will hold 12,048 ounces. That's kind of a big number. It's a lot easier to just refer to 16 gallons than it is 12,048 ounces, especially if I'm trying to calculate how much I'm going to spend on gas to fill up my tank. Well, I could try to use a little larger unit of measurement and switch to quarts instead. Well, that would be the equivalent of 512 quarts to fill up my, my gas tank. Or I could just use the largest unit of measurement, which is gallons, and refer to 16 gallons. It's a lot easier to do the math if I'm multiplying 16 gallons times the price per gallon than I am if I'm multiplying 12,048 ounces times the cost per ounce.
So we'd like to use smaller numbers when possible. It's not really necessary that I know precisely how many ounces of fluid are in my gas tank. I just need to know approximately, and 16 gallons will get me close enough, accepting the fact that there's a little bit of rounding error involved there. So the largest unit of measurement is the one that is really preferred here. Now, going back to our data measurements, we started with bits. And remember, we kind of talked about the fact bits are ones and zeros, and they're not really the most important thing for us to know about. The most important thing really are, is the byte. And a byte is eight bits. Really though, what I want you to remember is that a byte is one character. So just remember a byte is one character. Now, because computers can hold and process so many bytes, the numbers get really big, just like if we're talking about ounces of gasoline in our car. So what we do is we come up with larger units of measurement, kind of like quarts and gallons, in order to bring down the sizes of the numbers a little bit. We reduce the precision, but that's okay. We don't need to know down to every last byte. We just need to know a good approximation. So a kilobyte is our next larger unit of measurement, just like a quart would be compared to an ounce. A kilobyte is equal to 1,000 bytes. So we could talk about bytes in actual numbers of bytes, or we could just refer to thousands of bytes as kilobytes. A megabyte would be the next level up. So a megabyte is equal to 1 million bytes. Uh, which incidentally is the same as 1,000 kilobytes. So uh, it's a lot easier to talk about millions of bytes as megabytes rather than using the numbers at their full precision. After megabytes, we have gigabytes. Now you, you should be able to kind of see the pattern here. Uh, a gigabyte is one billion bytes. All we're doing is we're just adding three zeros to each prior unit of measurement. So just keep adding three zeros. If you can remember the order that these come in, you can always figure out what the quantities are. Now one gigabyte is one billion bytes, or it's 1,000 megabytes, just like one megabyte is 1,000 kilobytes. These are always in increments of 1,000. Finally, we have terabytes. A terabyte is one trillion bytes, which is equivalent to 1,000 gigabytes. Again, we're just adding three zeros. Here's the great thing about this system. If you can divide and multiply by 1,000, you can do all the math you'll ever need to do here. This is not really complex math. It's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. You just need to be able to divide and multiply by 1,000. Let's take an example of how we can take a big number and reduce it way down using these units of measurement. So I'm going to start here with a ridiculously large number of bytes. It's 1,250,500,300,600 bytes. Now, if I use if I use kilobytes as my unit of measurement, I could reduce it down a little bit. I could, I could take off those last three digits and call it 1,250,500,300 kilobytes. It's a little bit smaller number, but still a big mouthful. Or I could use megabytes as my unit of measurement, make it even smaller. Now I can refer that to as to 1,250,500 megabytes or 1,250 gigabytes, or just like going from ounces to gallons, I could call this 1.3 terabytes, 1.3 trillion bytes. Now I'm losing much of the precision, but that's okay. Usually when we're measuring data as an end user, it's not important that we know every last byte. We just need to get a pretty good accurate approximation. And that's exactly what this does for us. So again, if you can multiply and divide by 1000, you've got it. Now the actual number here, when we're working with bytes and bits on a computer system, it's not really 1000 as an increment, it's actually 1024 bytes in a kilobyte. I don't really need you to know that. 
really the important thing here is that 1,000 is your, your critical number. Uh, with that, it's really easy to do the math. You're going to be close enough, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to resolve pretty much any problem you have to solve by being able to measure data in that way. Now, here's my tip of the day. When you see the word bytes, you're looking at a measure of quantity of data or capacity. So kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, all of those words have the word byte as part of them. That word means you're looking at a measure of capacity or of data. So keep that in mind because as we go forward, we will encounter some additional terms that sound similar in many ways, but they're really quite different. So bytes means quantity or capacity of data. Now let's discuss computer speed and how we measure that. Now there are a couple of components that really impact the performance of a computer overall. The first one that we're going to discuss is the motherboard. And specifically, we'll be talking about motherboard bus speeds. Now, if you think about the CPU in a computer, the CPU basically is the thing that processes the data. And in order for that to happen, it needs to be able to get data from the peripheral devices, which are the input-output devices. Those are things like the keyboard, the printer, the mouse, the monitor, and so forth. The CPU is tends to be the fastest component in many ways on the computer. In fact, CPUs spend an awful lot of their time just waiting for data to show up. The bottlenecks in computers isn't so much the processor not being able to process data fast enough, it's the processor having to wait for that data to get to them because the computer or the motherboard can't move the data quickly enough to the processor in order to keep it busy. When that happens, the CPU just has to sit and wait for the data to arrive. It has idle time, and that's literally what it's called is idle time, where the CPU just sits there with nothing to do because there's just no data for it to work with. So what does it do? Well, it plays solitaire. It, it does whatever it can do. Basically, it does absolutely nothing while it's waiting for that data delivery. And it's kind of like uh, if you're sitting at work and people are bringing you stuff to work on, but nobody shows up with any projects for you and you just sit there staring out the window until somebody shows up with a task for you to work on. So during that time, that idle time, it's wasted. There, there really is nothing going on. You're just sitting there at the keyboard waiting for the computer to do something. The CPU is waiting for, have, for it to have something to do, but the data just has not shown up yet from the hard drive or the keyboard or someplace else. Now, here's a pretty good analogy, I think, of how this process works. The CPU essentially has to get data from each one of the peripheral devices. It cycles through them. So it goes to the keyboard, it goes to the mouse, it goes to the monitor, it goes to the printer. It goes back and forth and it picks up and delivers data to each one of those peripheral devices. Now, the analogy here is that of a school bus. If you think about the school sort of like being the CPU, and the students being like the data, uh, the, uh, the job of a school bus is to go back and forth between the school and the various bus stops to pick up and deliver students to and from the school. And the way it has to do that is just by going one bu bus stop at a time, picks up and delivers, picks up and delivers the next bus stop, and so forth. The faster it can do that, the, the more efficient the school essentially is because it has more students occupying the time there. It's not empty waiting for students to show up. So then the question I have is if we use this as an analogy, what are the factors that will influence the ability of the school bus to get its job done faster? What are some of the things maybe that stand in the way of the school bus? Uh, and under what scenario might the school bus be more efficient? Well, I would argue really that there are two key factors that will influence the ability of a school bus to get the job done sooner rather than later. And the first of those factors is the size of the bus. If you have two different school buses and one holds twice as many students as the other bus, well, the bigger bus is going to get the job done faster. 
even if they go at the same speed, the bigger bus only has to make half as many trips as the smaller bus. So that alone will make it more efficient. So the size of the bus, how many passengers can be carried, will be a key factor that influence the performance. The second factor is the speed of the bus. How fast can it go? Obviously, a bus that travels faster is going to get the job done quicker. All the other factors being the same. So if we put those two factors together, a bigger, faster bus is going to get the job done quicker. It's going to be more efficient than a smaller and or slower bus. Well, that's the same thing that occurs in a computer. A bus that's a computer actually uses something called a bus to transfer data. And the reason they use that term bus is because it's a perfect analogy for what I just showed you on that little map. And uh, the, the technical term is actually called a front side bus, and you'll often see it abbreviated as FSB. And when you see that term, front side bus or FSB, this is what it's referring to. It's referring for the motherboard's ability to move data between the CPU and the peripheral devices. The size of the bus is measured in bits, and there are different bus sizes. Typically, the bus sizes on computers are either 32 bits or 64 bits. Most of the time, most contemporary computers, it's usually 64 bits. Tablets um, and uh, devices with uh, smaller processes, processors uh, are very often 32 bits, so they'll be a little bit smaller bus but uh, typically it's going to be 32 or 64 bits. Now, the speed of the bus, when we talked about the school bus, the speed would be measured in miles per hour. But in a computer, the speed is measured in something called hertz. One hertz is one cycle per second. You can sort of think of a cycle as the CPU transferring data to all of the peripheral devices one time. So if the CPU can run and exchange data with the printer, with the keyboard, with the mouse, with the monitor, with the modem, with every other device that it has capable to exchange data with, one time, that would be one hertz if it can do it once per second. So once one hertz is one cycle per second. Because the numbers get really big, because CPUs can do this billions of times per second, we run into the same problem that we run into with bytes, which is the numbers are just huge. So we use the same units of measurement here to try to keep the numbers a little bit smaller. So we use the term kilo to indicate 1,000 cycles per second. When we put kilo together with hertz, we get one kilohertz, and that would be 1,000 cycles per second. One megahertz would be one million cycles per second. One gigahertz would be one trillion cycles per second. So here's the tip. When you see the term hertz, you're looking at a measure of speed of a component, in this case of the motherboard. So hertz is a measure of speed. Bytes, as you recall, is a measure of size, capacity, or quantity. So two different measures, although that prefix could be the same, kilo, mega, tera, giga, and so forth. Now that we've discussed all the considerations relating to RAM and the motherboard's bus, it's time to take a look at what our final selection criteria should be. So if, if you're shopping for a computer and you're comparing the motherboards of multiple computers versus one another, here are three basic things to look at. One is the bus speed. So we know that a faster bus speed is better. It's usually referred to as the FSB or front side bus. And it's typically measured in megahertz or gigahertz. So again, faster is better. Second is the bus size. Now typically for most computers today, it'll either be 32 bits or 64 bits. A 64 bit but bit bus will be a faster computer. And then finally, we have the RAM size and the capacity. So key question, how much RAM does the computer come with already installed?
And then secondly, how much RAM can it ultimately hold? Most of the time, or much of the time, computers aren't shipped with the maximum amount of RAM that they're capable of holding. They come installed with something less than that, which means you can add to it in the future. So those are two key questions to answer. How much does it come with and how much can it ultimately hold? Now that we've discussed the motherboard, let's move on to the CPU, the central processing unit. So as you recall from our earlier discussion, a CPU is just really a single silicone chip that plugs into the motherboard and is responsible for all of the processing that goes on in the computer. The speed of a CPU is called its clock speed. And the clock speed is actually pretty simple. It's how many times per second the CPU can execute instructions. Like the motherboard, the clock speed is measured in hertz. So if a CPU can, can process instruction, instructions once every second, that would be the equivalent to one hertz of processing speed. If it could do it at 1,000 times per second, that would be one kilohertz. One million times per second would be called one megahertz. And one billion times per second would be one gigahertz. Now, this is potentially a little bit confusing because these are the exact same terms that we use to describe motherboard bus speed. But here they're used in a different context. They're used to describe CPU speed. It's really important to stay focused on which speed you're looking at when you're evaluating a computer. Are you looking at the computer's motherboard bus speed or are you looking at the CPU's clock speed? Now the clock speed of the CPU is not necessarily the same as the motherboard's bus speed. The two can actually be quite different from one another. Now one additional factor that's important to consider when it comes to CPUs is the concept of multi-core CPUs. So a multi-core CPU is basically a CPU. So again, we have a picture of our CPU chip. Now imagine that if on this one chip, there were actually two CPUs, two central processing units working side by side. So we'll kind of illustrate what that might look like. The idea here is that if you can put two CPUs on a single chip, it can be a much more efficient chip because both CPUs can work side by side to split up the work. One does half the work, the other does the other half of the work. So working side by side, they don't have to actually operate at a really high clock speed in order to be able to do an incredible amount of work. So this, does, this has a couple of really major advantages. One is that um, CPUs can have any number of cores. They're usually even numbers, so usually you'll see like a, a dual core or quad core would be four, six cores, eight cores. Eight cores is about the largest you normally see commercially uh, in, these, in these days. Uh, but, um, but with those multiple cores, the more of them that there are, the more powerful the chip is. Now, there's another advantage to having these multi-cores, and that's the fact that the, the CPU does not have to run at as high a clock speed to do an incredibly huge amount of work in, in order to be really, really efficient. So what that means is that if it can run at a slower clock speed, it can generate less heat. A lot of the power in a computer goes toward trying to keep the CPU cool. So there are fans in there that are constantly moving air, and there's all, all kinds of stuff going on really just dedicated to keeping the CPU uh, cool. This is particularly important in a laptop where you have a computer that has to rely on battery life, and people want long battery life in a laptop computer. Well, if the if the CPU is a really high performance CPU and runs at a very high clock speed, it's going to generate a lot of heat and it's going to need a lot of fans to keep it cool. But if you can make it do that same amount of work, but running at a slower clock speed, but with more multiple cores, you can bring down the energy consumption, you can lengthen the battery life, and you can have really, really high performance computing power in a small laptop computer that runs on a battery. So this is the idea behind multi-core CPU chips. So they get more work done because they can work side by side, they can split up the job, and 
Each of them takes a, a piece of the uh, of the work, and they require less power. They don't go as fast. They don't require as much power to actually operate the chip, and they don't require as much power to keep the chip cool. Now, if a CPU is the thing you're evaluating, um, <clears throat> there are two basic things to to evaluate. One is the speed of the CPU. Now this is going to be the clock speed and it's going to be measured. Usually it'll be stated either in megahertz or gigahertz. So um, if it's in gigahertz, the number will be a little bit smaller. If it's in megahertz, the number is going to be a little bit bigger. It'll have three more zeros on it. All you're doing is just rounding it by a thousand to get from megahertz to gigahertz. The second thing we look at is the number of cores. So the more cores that the chip has, the more work it can do. In other words, the faster, the higher, the higher, um, the efficiency and the performance of the CPU chip. So those two things together are going to dictate just how fast that CPU chip is capable of getting its work done. I'm saying fast, and I really mean how, how powerful it is, because speed uh, is really a function of both the number of cores and the speed. So a, a chip with fewer cores has to go faster than a chip with more cores in order to keep up with it. And then finally, uh, better energy consumption with a multi-core chip. So those are our basic selection criteria when we're comparing CPUs. Now, on a practical matter, if you'd like to see exactly how your computer is configured with respect to the CPU and RAM, uh, you can, in Windows, use the Windows Control Panel. The easy way to find that is just by typing Control Panel in the search box next to the Windows Start button. Once you're in the control panel, you can go to System and Security, and uh, under System, you'll see you have an option here to view amount of RAM and processor speed. Clicking on that now takes us to that screen where we can see that this particular computer has an Intel Core i7 um, running at 2.3 gigahertz, and it has uh, eight gigabytes of installed memory and it is a 64-bit operating system, which means that it is a 64-bit motherboard and CPU. Okay, we're now ready to move on to computer hard drives. Now, hard drives are basically the long-term memory in a computer. Early on, we talked about short-term memory versus long-term memory. The long-term memory is where things get stored for the long term. Uh, think of it like your filing cabinet at home versus your desk. When you've got stuff on your desk, which is like your short-term memory, it's out where it's readily accessible, it's really fast and easy to get to, but you wouldn't want to keep that stuff on your desk full-time all the time. You want to put it away when you're done with it so that it you can put other things on your desk in, in place of it. So think of that kind of like your, your file cabinet. So when we're talking about computer hard drives, this again is our long-term memory in, our, in a computer. And I'm, I am going to say there are two and a half types of hard drives. Um, one is a mechanical hard drive. One is an SSD or a solid state hard drive. And then finally, there are hybrid drives, which are combinations of the two, which is kind of why I say it's two and a half different types of hard drives. So these are really three different technologies that are used for long-term storage in a computer. Now, uh, if we were to take a look inside of a drive, this is what one looks like. Uh, it uh, uses magnetic disks, and uh, the thing that you see on the top there is uh, called a read-write head, and it sweeps across the disk, sort of like a record player needle on a, on a record. Uh, as the disk spins, the read-write head sweeps across, and uh, it's very quick it, it, for it to find any particular spot on the disk. You have two moving parts that are both moving at the same time. So you've got the spinning of the disk, the sweeping of the uh, head. It can get to any spot on the disk. And the purpose of the head is to read and write data, meaning it can put data on the disk or it can read data back from the disk. The uh, disks uh, are called platters. And if you look inside, you'll see there are actually uh, five of them on this uh, particular hard drive. When uh, a file is saved on a hard drive, uh, 
the, the file is actually split up into multiple sections and each section is saved to a different platter. And the reason that it works that way is because it's faster and it's more efficient. If you, if you put it all in one place, it takes it longer for it to do it rather than splitting it up and putting it on multiple platters at the same time. Each platter can read and write independently. So um, by splitting it up, it's just much faster. It's just a way to make this mechanical device go faster. One of the advantages of mechanical hard drives is they're relatively cheap. The uh, cost per megabyte or per gigabyte of storage is actually quite low. So uh, that makes it a relatively uh, attractive um, device. It's, it's, it's a technology that's been around for a long time. Um, they tend to be relatively reliable, although hard drives do crash. And um, the adage is that you should do backups not in case of a hard drive failure, but for when there is a hard drive failure. In other words, assume that your drive will fail because statistically, the probability is that it will fail someday, no matter how reliable it's been up until this point. Tomorrow may be the day that you turn on your computer and it no longer works. Uh, they are relatively reliable, though. Most of the time, they don't just crash um, unexpectedly um, you know, with, with a lot of frequency. Um, the speed of a hard drive, although is they are pretty fast by today's standards, um, they're relatively slow compared to other types of technologies. And the reason is because there are moving parts inside. There's a disc that has to spin. There's a read write head that has to be able to move around. So um, anytime you have moving parts that you're dependent on for something to happen, it's going to take longer. It's just the basic physics of the technology. The speed is measured in uh, really two measures. One is called seek time, which is how long it takes to find something on the disk. And normally that's stated in milliseconds. Um, a millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. Uh, another measure that's probably a little bit better one is called the data transfer rate. And that's essentially how many megabytes or gigabytes per second can that drive transfer data for on a sustained basis? So uh, how, how much data can it move and how fast can it move it? So it's usually bytes per second in some way. Uh, RPMs are another measure that are sometimes used. The, uh, it stands for re revolutions per minute and it's how fast the disk is spinning. And uh, the disks uh, in these um, hard drives can spin anywhere from maybe about 4,800 revolutions per minute up to maybe 10 or 12,000. So they, they can spin up pretty fast. It's kind of a crude measure. I mean, in general, a 10,000 RPM drive is going to be faster than a 5,000 RPM drive, but you don't know exactly how much faster. The data transfer rate is really the best way to measure the speed of the hard drive. And because the CPU is so dependent on getting data from the hard drive, the hard drive is really one of those pivotal components in the computer. A fast hard drive can make a fast CPU operate really, really quickly. A slow hard drive can bring everything to a crawl. You can have the fastest available CPU and it won't be able to work very fast if it has to be paired up with a very slow hard drive. So the hard drive is a really important factor when it comes to computer performance. Now, SSD drives, our second technology, stands for solid state drive. And an SSD drive essentially is using flash memory which is uh, what flash drives work with. So when we, when we talk about flash drives, uh, flash memory, it's the same as an SSD drive, except that it's not removable storage like a, a flash drive would be. You plug a flash drive into a USB port, and when you're done, you can pull it out and walk away with it. Well, an SSD drive is built into the computer. It doesn't plug into an, an, a USB port. It is hardwired inside of the computer. Um, advantages of SSD drives is that they're really, really fast in comparison to mechanical hard drives. The reason for that is because there are no moving parts. It's just silicon chips. So without moving parts, 
uh, the data can be transferred a lot faster. They tend to be relatively reliable, again, because there's no moving parts, there really is very little to wear out inside of one of them, although they do have a limited life. Um, a sector on an SSD drive can be uh, written to uh, approximately one million times before it'll start to fail. So SSD drives do wear out after a while. Um, there's technology that's used to load balance them so that when files are saved to the SSD drive, uh, the, um, the, the CPU knows to try to put them in different places every time so that they don't exhaust that one million write limit in any one place too quickly. Um, so again, they're relatively fast, they're relatively reliable. The downside to them is the cost. They're relatively expensive on a cost per gigabyte or cost per byte measure. Uh, compared to a mechanical hard drive, you can buy a lot more storage for the same price with a mechanical hard drive than you can with an SSD drive. My, uh, my guess is that uh, over time, um, as the industry transitions more and more to SSD drives, eventually they'll supplant uh, mechanical hard drives and uh, the, the manufacturing costs will, will come down much more so uh, in comparison. So I think eventually they will be the cheaper alternative. And then finally, we have hybrid drives. So a hybrid drive is a mechanical hard drive that has a SSD drive attached to it. It's like a small SSD drive. And uh, the way they're designed to work is that the operating system is uh, able to see the SSD drive and it will put the most frequently used files on the SSD portion of the drive. Uh, those are the files that because you're constantly using them, these would be things like the operating system like Windows or Mac OS or whatever it is. Because those files are used frequently, you want them to be on the faster part of the drive. So the idea here is that the if if the operating system is in the SSD portion, you turn on the computer, it's going to boot up much quicker rather than having it on the mechanical hard drive portion. So this is all managed behind the scenes. Uh, there's software that tries to figure out what should go where. And um, uh, the bottom line is that you try it. They, it's, a, it's an attempt to give you the most bang for the buck. So you get a lot of storage on the mechanical hard drive relatively cheaply, but you get some of the benefits of an SSD drive as well. Now, when we're comparing hard drives between computer systems, here are the factors that you want to compare. The first is the to total storage capacity. How much can this thing hold? Now, on a hybrid drive, they usually will just give you one number, which is going to be the combined storage. So they, it, it, it's, now, it's no different than comparing any other type of drive. But what is the total capacity going to be? And that could range anywhere from uh, hundreds of gigabytes to maybe three or four terabytes or more. Next is the speed of the drive. What is the performance of the drive? And we're probably going to best measure that using the data transfer rate. And that will always be stated in terms of number of bytes per second that can be transferred. Because the numbers get big, they'll usually state it as uh, megabytes or gigabytes. Next, finally, is the reliability. Now, the reliability for a drive is measured by something called MTBF, which st stands for Mean Time Between Failures. Now, the quality testing for hard drives works something like this. What they do is they randomly take hard drives as they're manufactured off the assembly line, put them into computers, and then they basically make the drives work. They'll, they'll run a program which does nothing but just make the, work, the drive work nonstop. So it'll read and write and read and write and read and write nonstop 24-7. And then what they do is they test the drive looking for errors. When the errors start to occur, they can use that to statistically predict how long it would take that drive to fail ultimately. So what they try to do is they try to come up with an estimate of about how many hours of operating time the drive is likely to be useful for. And that number is stated in hours, and it usually will run anywhere from 
tens of thousands of hours to hundreds of thousands of hours up to maybe about a million hours or so. The bigger, a bigger number is better. A bigger number means it's a more reliable drive. This is a critical step to look at when you're in an organization that has to rely on that digital data to maintain its operations. So for example, in a healthcare environment, it's critically important that you be able to access those patient records pretty much any time you need them. So um, if a drive is unreliable and that computer goes down, even if the data is backed up and you can recover the data, there's downtime associated with it. So that can become an issue. So we want the most reliable drive as possible as well. Now, the last uh, components that we're going to discuss as part of this online discussion will be our backup devices. Now, these are essentially the devices that we use to make sure that if, the, um, if there is a failure to the computer system of some sort, um, that we don't lose our data entirely. We have some sort of backup support that we'll, we're able to recover from. Now, um, when it comes to uh, this idea of backing up, um, it's really, really, really important to consider the fact that it's not a matter of if something will go wrong, it's a matter of when something will go wrong. It's guaranteed, absolutely, at some point in your life, something will fail on a computer system, you will lose data. Statistically, it's, it's pretty much a, a certainty. So uh, what are some of the things that can go wrong? Well, hard drive failures can go wrong. They, they do fail occasionally, and um, they may not fail entirely, but uh, maybe the portion of the drive that holds the data that, or the file that you particularly need that's really important to you, maybe, um, uh, maybe the part that fails. Power surges can uh, literally fry the inside of a computer and uh, cause uh, enough destruction that uh, renders the computer unusable. User error. We can't really, um, we can't really, uh, user error is something that we, we can't really, um, user error is something that has to definitely be considered because this is probably the most common thing that happens when files are, when data is lost. Uh, files can be very easily deleted or overwritten just simply by mistake, and then poof, they're gone. Sometimes they can be recovered, sometimes they can't. Natural disasters, uh, floods, uh, fires. Um, I, I've personally seen situations where fires have occurred in facilities and uh, computers are damaged uh, beyond uh, use and beyond repair. So these are all things that really need to be uh, considered and have to be planned for. In other words, you should have a plan in terms of how you will deal with any one of these things going wrong. Now, in a healthcare environment, it's doubly important that, that the data be recoverable in the event that something goes wrong because people's lives are quite literally at stake. If you're not able to get some, to someone's medical history or, um, or to their charts when needed, if it's electronic, um, there could be a problem, especially if you have a, an emerging situation uh, or a trauma situation where you need that information and you need to know it right now. So here are some backup principles. There, there are four basic backup principles that I like to focus on when I consider designing a backup solution for a computer system. One is redundancy. The idea here is that backup devices can fail just like the computer can fail. And I, I have actually seen situations where backup drives, backup USB drives have failed, flash drives have even failed. They can fail. So relying on a backup device um, by itself is really not the best thing to do unless you can back up the backup. <laughs> so basically what this means is you do more than one backup. You don't just rely on one backup device. You rely on multiple backup devices. So if one of them fails and the computer fails, you still have another one that you can go to, at least one other. I, I've seen this done with up to four or five redundant backup devices. 
and um, it seems like a lot of hoops to jump through, but I've seen at least one situation where um, the, the individual made five backups and four of the devices fail. The fifth one is the one that finally worked. Had he not done five backups, he would have completely lost all of his data. The second principle is that of geographic separation. Now, the basic idea here is this. Anything bad that can happen to the computer can also happen to the backup if they're stored in the same place. So if you back up a computer by pl plugging a hard drive into it, and you, you have an external USB hard drive sitting right next to it, and the building burns down, yeah, it was backed up, but it's not going to do you any good because you've lost both things now. It's important that you geographically separate the backup device from the computer that's being backed up because otherwise anything bad that can happen to the computer can also happen to the backup. Now in reality there's another factor which is the fourth one I'll jump ahead which is convenience. You want the convenience of being able to easily recover from a backup in the event that you need to. So for that to be in effect, you sort of need to have the backup close by. Well, um, this sort of works with redundancy. If you have more than one backup, you can keep one close by the computer on site in the same facility and then keep the other backup stored elsewhere. I've seen situations where uh, employees will take a backup device home with them so it's separate from the facility where the computer is that is being backed up. Uh, this is actually kind of important sometimes in the event of, say, an earthquake where a large area can be affected or maybe a flood or a hurricane if you're in a uh, hurricane risk area. Um, yeah, it, it may not be useful to have it just across the street. You may need more distance than that in order to keep it safe. But with, with redundancy, you can have one backup device close by and um, available in the event that you have to restore an accidentally deleted file in a, in a hurry. And you can have one off-site that is, um, is safe from whatever bad thing is happening at the facility. Now, finally, the last principle is that you need to have adequate capacity. This one kind of goes beyond without saying. Whatever hard drive capacity the computer has, you need to have at least that much backup capacity. Now, typically, you actually want more than that because the way most backups work today is that they work incrementally, which means that they're maintaining a history of changes to files. So um, this is kind of a nice thing to do. With an incremental backup, every single time a file is changed, it will be a new version of it gets backed up and added to that backup archive. And what that means is that at any point in time, you can go back through history and restore a file to what it looked like two days ago, three days ago, five days ago, some prior point in time. Now, normally there's there's a, uh, a kind of a window on that. You don't do it indefinitely, but you know over um, maybe a two or three or four week period. So this helps in situations where maybe somebody does something that messes up a file. So for example, somebody does something really bad on the accounting system and um, the uh, the main database for the accounting system now has this uh, huge error in it. It would be great if you could just roll the clock back to just before that happened. Well, with um, incremental backups, you can do that. For incremental backups to work though, you need a lot of capacity. So if the hard drive holds one terabyte, you probably need something closer to a two terabyte backup device to hold everything that could con conceivably could be contained on the drive, plus the incremental part of it, which is the different versions of those files over time. Now, in terms of backup devices, uh, typically it boils down to maybe three types of devices. Uh, we have uh, external hard drives, and um, I think most people are familiar with those. And these are just typical hard drives that plug into the computer with a USB cable. Um, they can typically hold a lot of information. They are typically fairly rugged and durable little things, um, and they can really work very well. Um, I've seen uh, situations where maybe, um, let's say, three or four or five 
external hard drives are put into operation and then they're rotated. Uh, so maybe every week a different drive gets used for the backup and the drive that had been used gets moved off site. So what that does is it actually creates some redundancy because now you have drives that contain much of the same data and uh, it reduces the amount of wear and tear on any one drive because uh, the drives are getting rotated. They're, they're not, it's not just one drive that gets used every single day. It's one drive that gets used maybe every third week or every fourth week. So external hard drives very commonly used, relatively inexpensive, um, relatively reliable, although I have had situations where I have had external backup hard drives uh, both go bad, uh, go bad on me. And, and, I, and specifically, I had a situation where I had two that I was using for redundant backups, and both of them failed. So um, again, you can't assume that just because they're there, they're always, always going to work and be there for you. Okay, the second type of device is a digital tape. And uh, you can see that little cassette in the upper right-hand corner there. That That's a, a DAT. It stands for digital audio tape. It's a relatively high capacity. You can actually uh, compress a lot of data and squeeze it onto a, a, a tape. Now, uh, tapes used to be pretty much the only way you stored information on a computer, and then they kind of went out of favor, mainly because they're quite slow and um, not very reliable. They stretch and they can break. And more recently, they've sort of come back, believe it or not, uh, and they're actually used. Now, the... Um, the big robotic thing you see in the middle is actually a robotic um, tape library, and that is used to manage uh, backups in a large corporate environment. So uh, these tapes can actually get pulled out of an archive, plugged into their drives, and rotated and used appropriately, basically by this robot. And um, they, they do hold a lot of data. They've gotten a lot faster, and they have gotten uh, much more reliable. So they, they do tend to get a bit to be in use much more so than uh, they were even just a few years ago. Then finally, we have online cloud backups. So these are backups that occur over the internet. And typically, um, your computer will have some sort of software installed on it. And uh, as the files change on your computer, they are uploaded to a cloud server someplace in the world. and um, and, and copies of those files are now on an offsite server. Now, that uh, cloud backup idea uh, solves a couple of issues with respect to our principles. One is the geographic separation. By definition, it's geographically separated because it's offsite. Uh, the redundancy, um, uh, you, what you've now done if you use one of these is you you've basically have made that company that you're subscribing to the one responsible for maintaining the redundancy. If you trust them, that's great. It's not that I wouldn't trust anyone, but I would always want to have my own backup on top of a cloud backup just in case. A couple of downsides to cloud backups, they're slow. And the reason is because it's hard to move big data files quickly through the internet. It's just not uh, really fast throughput. Uh, the other potential issue is in the event that you lose internet access. So for example, uh, you have maybe a major um, disaster like an earthquake and um, you don't have access to, uh, to power or internet connectivity. Uh, in situations like that, you, you may lose the ability to get your backup back. Now, uh, most of these companies that do online cloud backups actually will provide for that. Uh, many of them will have a service that you can pay for where they'll send you a hard drive. Uh, they can overnight it to you so that the next day you you have your entire backup on, a, uh, on an external hard drive that you can just plug into your computer and you can recover from that. So you don't have to rely on the, um, on the internet to restore your backup. Um, otherwise, there is one other possible issue with uh, cloud backups, and that has to do with HIPAA compliance. So under HIPAA, if you're a healthcare provider, you're not allowed to share a patient's data with a third party without that patient's permission. So a cloud provider, an online cloud backup provider, is a third party. So technically speaking, um, 
in that situation, it's possible that it would be non-compliant with respect to HIPAA. So that becomes more of a legal question than a logistic question. That's one for a lawyer to address within a particular organization. And the answer, I suspect, will be related to um, what the provisions are of the contract with the cloud backup server, uh, what type of encryption they use. Um, it, it, they, many of these services will use multiple layers of encryption uh, and the wording of the, uh, the legal agreement with that backup uh, cloud services provider. So um, again, that's one that a legal opinion would be, um, would be definitely a good idea for. So that concludes our discussion of backup devices. Now, um, all of these uh, devices are discussed in the reading, so please make sure to complete all of the reading in the computer hardware chapter of the textbook, and um, you'll have an opportunity to use the, um, the knowledge that you've gained here and in the reading uh, in a real-world uh, assignment in class.